Morning, Michelle. How are you? Good morning. I'm great, thank you. How are you? Very well indeed. Very well indeed. The sun's come out in Devon, which we haven't seen the sunshine for about uh, six weeks. Well, look so at you. It's not arrived everyone... yet. Lancashire. Oh, and everyone's Dylan stopping Cloud. work today and just going going out and enjoying the day. Um, <laughs> so lots of lots of questions from worried parents who who may have just realised their child has got emetophobia or they've known for some time and they try to help or being for some interventions you know you, you know what it's like you know what can what can a parent do who's got a ch- it's almost worse isn't it do you know what i mean it's, it's almost worse to see someone you love yeah. suffering from something than you having it yourself in fact it, it is worse isn't it yeah You'd much 100%. rather have it yourself yes it's a broken leg i'd much rather have it myself than one of my kids Oh, 100%. Because at least if it's me, I can do something about it. Yes. If it's your kids, your, your, your precious bundle of joy, you know, mm-hmm. you um you feel even more powerless, right? Yes. So yep. the questions today are, let's have the top four or five tips yep. for a parent who's got a child with emetophobia. Yes. Okay. okay, happy with that? Yep, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Right, I'm going to throw this over to you then, because you're working with loads of uh, youngsters. Mm-hmm. What would you say the top five things would be. I've got some written down here, what I think. Yeah. So I tell you my list and you okay. tell me whether you agree with me or not. You can do, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I've got number one, building coping skills. Yeah. Number two, helping them build self-esteem and their yeah. inner voice. Yeah. Uh, number three is making sure the parents don't collude. And, and if I had to, these aren't ranked, right? But if I had to rank them, I'd put that number one. Okay. Most important thing, yeah. making sure as a parent you're not colluding. Yes. Yeah, yeah. we'll explain what that is in a minute. And um, probably not giving the child too much power and giving in to their desire for control. Yes. All of that really comes under the heading of upskilling. Yes, yes. Upskilling would as a parent. Would you agree with that? I would. I would. And I think, as you say, you know, the top one would be not giving in, not colluding. Yeah. I think in order to be able to do that, the parent needs to know what that is and they okay. need to understand emetophobia, a little bit about emetophobia, so that they don't do that. So I would kind of put the upskilling bit at the top, slightly above not giving in to the colluding behaviours. Yeah, of course, because how, how can they not give in until they know what it means? Right. Okay. Right. So, so first of all is upskilling. Find out all they can Mm-hmm. about emetophobia and they can yeah. do that on our website they don't even need to buy a manual or go nope. to your coach yep e- even if they just watch the podcasts on the yes. website they yep. gain enough information from that yes. a good enough understanding of it from that yes okay I was, yeah, um, number one yep and obviously we were very happy to answer any questions they want to send in about that yes. so when, once they've got a good understanding of what emetophobia is oh and one more thing i didn't i couldn't read my bloody writing excuse me um <laughs> One of the other ones was, and I don't know whether you found this, a lot of pe- parents make the mistake of seeing their child's emetophobia as an individual symptom. Yes, yes. We, we know that emetophobes, generally speaking, are brighter than the average child, right? They're more dedicated, they're, they're, they work harder, they're, they're, they are more driven. Um, so in other words... Quite often you'll see a young emetophobe, as you would an adult emetophobe, mm-hmm. that everywhere else in their life they've got it completely together. Yes. And so when they've got this phobia, it can look like a completely isolated thing. Yep. It looks like everything else is great apart from this one little thing here. Yes. And yes. they tend to see it as an isolated phobia yep. and then try and treat it yes. as an isolated thing. Everything else is great. It's mm-hmm. just a small little thing stuck yep. on the side. Yep. And I think that's a big problem for them. So should we start with that? We let's start with that. Yeah, it's um, happy with that. One hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent. I would say that that's um, one of the key mistakes. But it's not just a mistake parents make, right? This is this can be everybody because, as you say, emetophobes are so usually so highly driven and so successful everywhere else, even as children. But the problem with seeing it as an isolated thing is that you zoom in on it 
and you hone in on it and you just look at the behaviors around the emetophobia. So you only look at the fact that they want to wash their hands or they want a day off school or they won't eat this or they won't eat that. And you, you just hone in on those specific behaviors. But actually, all you're doing there is highlighting the avoidance behaviors or the safety seeking behaviors. And you can't just tackle those in isolation because you need to get right underneath what's supporting all of those safety seeking and avoidance behaviors, which is things like we're going to talk about the coping skills, the self-esteem, the beliefs and all that kind of things. So it's not looking at it as an isolated thing and not zoning in on those behaviors, um, which is really hard to do because that's all that you're seeing. So if you're not understanding what's underneath it, how can you do anything else? So it's kind of merging one and two here, aren't we? We're jumping about a bit, but the parents have to come and watch all these podcasts. They've got to research emetophobia, what it is, what builds it, what supports it. Because if they don't, they then all they can do is tackle those behaviours. Yeah. And the reason and the reason for that then is because if you if you see emetophobia as an individual symptom, as a symptom in itself, and try to treat that, it's not gonna work. No. No. Okay. Uh, so for clarity then, if this might be the first podcast a parent's seen, emetophobia isn't caused by being sick and isn't actually a fear of being sick or anything necessarily directly to do with being sick at all. Nope. So any any treatment or intervention that focuses on being sick just isn't going to help. No. Uh, emetophobia is caused by a series of beliefs and attitudes and thinking styles that permeates every area of that child's life. Yes. You just don't see it. Yes. Because it's, pre it's pretty hidden in their thinking and their and their day-to-day -day life. So yeah. you see this little symptom, like, this, like the tip of an iceberg, you think, oh, look, it's only that big, yes. when in fact it's much, much deeper than that. Yes. So if you try to get rid of their, their phobia of being sick just by focusing on that, a, it's not going to go. Yep. B, it's probably going to get worse because they're going to feel even more powerless and frustrated. Yes. So you've got yep. to see it in a, in a kind of holistic way mm -hmm. and realise that their phobia is a symptom of their overall yes. thinking, beliefs, attitudes, behaviours. You've got to stand yep. back and realise it's part of the whole. And if you treat the whole to you know get better, the emetophobia will disappear. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Does that yep. make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, and, and there's plenty of podcasts that we've done previously about the thoughts and, and, and feelings and the beliefs that drive that forward. Yep. Yes. So you have to take a step back and realize that, you know, the main contributing um, forces that, 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 create the emetophobia in the first place and drive the emetophobia are a series of beliefs, yep. thinking styles, attitudes, self-esteem, yep. uh, social anxiety, uh, and what we call the sense of power and control, how powerful they feel. Yes. Okay. Yep. All of those things need to be addressed. Raise all of those things. Yep. Help your child to, to uh, create much stronger self-esteem, uh, more social confidence, feel more powerful, et cetera, et cetera. And by doing that, their emetophobia will disappear because their emetophobia is a symptom of those things. Of those things. Yes. yes. So that's point number one. 100%. Okay. Yep. Don't see it yep. as an individual isolated symptom that just seems to come from nowhere and um, kind of stick out like a sore thumb yes. as the only part of this anxiety. No, the child's happy in every other area of their life. Yeah. That may be absolutely true, but it's still every other area of their life where their thinking and their beliefs and their behaviours and attitudes are that are causing that phobia. So yes. you've got to look at what's behind it all to help them. Yeah. Brilliant. That's number one. Number one. Perfect. So um, number two, what, what was your number two? Was it coping skills? <clears throat> are you asking me to rank these? I wasn't, it, but it... you can do if you want to. Well, if, if we're putting them in order of importance, the next thing I would say is not giving in to their desire for control. Let's do that. Which is really hard. That's probably the hardest thing yes, as a parent. Is. Yes, it is. Okay. Yep. Hardest thing as a parent, when your child is crying out for help and the help that they want you to give, you can't give mm -hmm. because it's only going to 
prolong their overall suffering. And what I mean by that is one of the key drivers, probably 80% of the thing that's maintaining a metaphobia with your child is their belief and your belief as a parent that this phobia is happening to them. Mm -hmm. Okay that they believe it's actually genuinely about being sick. So let's say you've got some of the phobia pens. Some of the phobia pens believes that that pen mm -hmm. is causing them the phobia. It's causing them to feel the pain and the anguish and the anxiety, okay? And while you believe it's something outside of yourself, you focus on it, you zoom in on it, you isolate it, but of course you feel quite powerless because you can't change that. You know, we, we joked about the weather earlier on, but actually, if you believe the cold, dark winter months can make you feel down and depressed, yep. you're going to be down and depressed. And there's nothing you can do about it because you can't change the weather. Mm -hmm. I can't change the fact that there are a zillion pens in the world. Nope. I can't change the fact that sometimes people are unwell and are sick. Yep. So you feel really powerless when you when you feel like this phobia could, could strike you at any minute, this thing could hit you at any time, and it's unpredictable and it's scary, which is not true because, as we know, it's not about something outside of yourself. Yeah. It's it's in their, in their heads. Yeah. It's the thinking styles, the beliefs, the attitudes, behaviours within their mind, within their thinking that mm -hmm. is causing it. Yes. So anything a parent does that colludes with their child's belief that it is about being sick, this outside thing, is unhelpful. Yes. Okay, it's unhelpful. Can I give an example of that? Yeah, go. Yeah. So I've just I've just finished working with a, a client um, who she's eleven, and she had really bad emetophobia. Parents couldn't go on holiday. She wouldn't stay away. She was, and the one thing that stuck out when you were just saying, uh, making that point was she I would ask her mum multiple times a day, am I going to be sick? Mum, am I going to be sick? And mum, having been henpecked with this question all day long for however many weeks and months, would just give in, no love, you're not going to be sick. No love, you're not going to be sick. But actually what all that's doing, obviously one, it's giving the mum a break, right? But it's very, very temporary. So the child then believes somehow that mum knows that she's not going to be sick, believes mum, and feels better for about 20, 30 seconds, a minute, but then starts building the anxiety again and everything else. It actually doesn't help in the long run to do that because what you're doing is you are allowing your child to believe that they can control the uncontrollable. So she, what she's doing is she's trying to control things that are beyond the realms of human control. She can't control whether she's going to be sick or not. Um, if she is, then she is. So the better thing to be doing would be to be building the child's ability to believe in themselves that actually, if I am, I'd cope. And actually, it's OK. I don't need to control that because it kind of goes hand in hand with the next point. Right. If we're going to come on to coping skills, it goes hand in hand. If you believe that you can cope, then you don't need to control if you're going to be sick. But as a parent, resisting the urge to go, no, love, you're not going to be sick is really important. And resisting that urge because it, it, it's it's what you know the child wants to hear because yeah. your child's in pain and yeah. you want to do anything to get them out of pain. But yeah. also, if, if you know if, if you if you've already answered that question a hundred times today, mm -hmm. you know you're you're getting bored bored of, of answering it and you're getting stressed by answering it and you just want to, you want a quick end to it all. Yeah. But what we're what we're saying specifically then is that I I use this metaphor. If you imagine that your child can't sleep. And, and they, 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 they're awake in the night and they come in to see you and they say, Mom, I can't sleep. I'm scared of the bogeyman. Mm -hmm. You go, right. And you say, oh, darling, don't worry. You're in here now. The bogeyman can't get you in here. Mm -hmm. And they visibly relax and they curl up on the bed next to you and they go to sleep. Yeah. Okay. So on the one hand, what you've done is brilliant. You've calmed your child down. You've supported them. You've loved them. You've given them that cuddle. You've reassured them and they relax enough to go to sleep. But you've maintained their belief that the bogeyman exists. Yes. They still yeah. believe the bogeyman exists and the bogeyman is real. He just can't get me in here. So yeah. long term, you've done nothing. Yes. All you've done is something to help them sleep right now. Yes. 
much, much better in that example to sit them down and explain that the bogeyman's just not real. Yes. It's not real. And even if it were real, you'd cope. You'd be all right. It might be a bit frightening if you saw something weird and strange like that, but you'd cope. You'd be okay. Yep. That's what they need to hear. Yes. That it's not some magical thing that happens for no reason, that it's that, that it's quite predictable and that they can control it in terms of how they respond to it and their emotions. Relate that to metaphobia. So when a child says, mummy, mummy, will I be sick? The, the ideal answer is, uh, no, you won't, darling. No, you won't. You're absolutely fine. But do you know what? You'd cope if you were sick. We mm -hmm. don't We don't have to um, try and run away from this thing all your life, right? Yeah. Everyone else in the world copes with it. It's just a little bit unpleasant. You'd be fine if you were sick. Yes. But no, you're not going to be sick. Yeah. So you're doing two things. You're... you're relaxing and reassuring them now but you're also reminding them mm -hmm. trying to point them in a slightly different direction and reminding them that actually it's a normal thing yes. everyone does it and they would cope yes yeah because if you don't do that their belief just goes on getting bigger and bigger and bigger and the, and, and their safety seeking behaviors have to get bigger and bigger and bigger yep and which kind of jumps on to the next question, which I won't do, I won't do uh, coping skills next. I, I, I do not giving into their desire for control. So when a person feels really, really anxious or feels really, really stressed, depending on the number of thinking styles and beliefs and attitudes they've got, as you know, there is this thing called desire for control. There is how much control a person wants. Yep. There is how much control they believe they need. And then there is this desire for control mm -hmm. so one thing a person does if they're in a frightening situation a stressful situation and they don't believe they can cope they try and control it instead yep okay and adults watching this will know that any adult watching this who's ever suffered from social anxiety and they've got a dinner party to go to tonight right we're recording this at 10 o'clock in the morning they've got a dinner party to go to tonight they're already thinking and worrying about the party tonight yep. yeah they're already because they because they're anticipating feeling vulnerable and on the spot tonight, they're already thinking not how can I control it, but how can I manage this? You know, yes. what do I need to know in advance? Who's going to be there? What am I going to wear? Um, are we going to take a drink? Are we going to take some food? Excuse me. You know, because they can't manage the, how they feel about it, they need to try and manage the situation. And ultimately, if they can't think of a way in which they can manage a situation. Do you know what I'll do? I'll go an hour later. Mm -hmm. I'll drink two pints of water before I go, or maybe I'll drink half a bottle of wine before I go to build up some confidence. I'll get there late or I'll get there early. And if they can't think of a way where they can manage it or control it well enough, they just won't go. Avoid it, yep. Okay. That's yep. their desire for control. Their desire to control the situation in order to um, limit their exposure to the thing that they don't like. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And that's just as prevalent in young children as it is in adults. Yes, 100%. If you've got a child who's got a, who's got a metaphobia, then they would already have a strong desire for control because mm -hmm. the whole nature of a phobia is a desire for control. That's that's what a phobia is, right? It's a strong yes. desire for control. I feel incredibly vulnerable and stressed in that situation, so I'm going to try and over-control things so I never get there. Yep. And that's what the safety-seeking behaviours are about. That's what the avoidance behaviours are about. Now the difficulty is, if we if we give in too much to their desire for control, the desire for control is just going to get stronger and stronger and yep. stronger. Yes. And they're not going to learn any coping skills. Yep. They're going to feel more and more. The child is going to feel more and more powerful about their ability to control and avoid situations. Yep. And what you're going to find further down the road is. They're not going to school. They're locking themselves in the bedroom. They're only yeah. going to drink water and eat eat one food substance. And they're not going to go out and see their friends. And they're not going to do this and the blah blah. You know. And before you know it, they've over controlled everything, or they've gained so much control yep. that the parents are running around looking after them, and they don't go to school, and they, they you know they're home educated. And there's nothing wrong with home education, right? But as an avoidance of being around other children, it's not yes. a good thing. And then they've got all this control. It's very difficult at that point, and I'd say very difficult. It's 
long-winded and laborious at that point yeah. for the parents to take back control. Yes. Because yeah. basically a strong desire for control is the absence of coping skills. Yes. So when your child says, you know, mummy, I don't want to go to school today. Um, someone yesterday said they had a, a sore tummy. Yeah, they were sick, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's agonising for that parent to say, sorry, but you've got to go to school. Yeah. Because the first time you let them not go, you're setting a precedent and again, you're giving in to their desire for control, and it becomes very difficult then the next day or a week later to say, sorry, you've got to go to school. Yep. But, Mummy, last week yep. it was all right not to go. Yep. And it's that's, this is really hard, and this is really testing for parents. Yep. You know, you, 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 you want to be as helpful and as reassuring and help them build the skills we're going to talk about in a minute yep. whilst giving as little away in terms of their power as possible yes so yes. having hard and fast rules if your child's never had a day off school because of a fit obviously if they're ill yeah they don't go to school right but to have a day off school because they're worried about the possibility of being ill is really unhelpful for the child yes it is because and you're it- giving them relief by allowing them to build their desire for control yes yep okay and it links so- directly to the coping skills we're going to talk about next i think what any parents watching this will be thinking, okay, yeah, that's great, but what do I say to them? So we're going to come on to that next when we talk about this, the coping skills and how to build them because it's, it's agonising as a parent to say you've got to go and you've got them screaming and kicking off and clinging to you and all this kind of stuff. It's hard. It's really, really difficult. But what you want to be doing is maintaining that. We've, we're going in. We're going in today and just keeping that firm line. You've got to go in today but building at the same time their coping skills so that each time it gets a little bit easier, they're desiring that control a little bit less. But that is, we're coming on to that. I just wanted to, yeah. to give every, an Every time there. anybody does something that they don't want to do and does something they feel anxious or stressed about, but they do it and they're successful in it, they get stronger, not weaker. Yes. Every time they run away from something by taking the day off or by not going to that party, okay, yep. they get weaker. They're giving, mm-hmm. they're giving their power away and they're just giving in to their desire for control so what would you say what would one say for a child that says mommy I don't want to go into school today um someone yesterday said they had a sore tummy yeah so as we've said you say we have to go in however you want to be upskilling yourself as we said earlier so that you know that they need to build the coping skills and and articulate that to them because in my experience I've worked with a lot of primary school children they understand the term coping they understand what it means to feel a bit uncomfortable and to get through that and they will have already had experiences like that in their life they'll have already been uncomfortable in certain situations and got through it they just might not have processed it they might not remember it so it's really important that you sit down with them and so say do you know what you can do difficult things you can cope when you're uncomfortable and I know that because of this and give yeah. them an, an example of when they've done that. Perhaps they went on a, on a residential, let's say, and, and went up the, um, the high ropes uh, and were really terrified of heights and were really scared. Um, and they said, oh, you know, I, my, my stomach went and I didn't want to do it and I cried, and I, but I, went, I did it, you know, and, and they, they, they were able to do it. Take them back to that moment and go, you did that. Remember, how did you do that? What were you telling yourself? It was brilliant. How did you feel after it? That's how you're going to feel at the end. And so you're building this belief in them that actually, yes, they can be uncomfortable, but they can cope with it. Yes. So they're building all of that coping skills, all of their ability. And that it's, we talk a lot about beliefs, the belief that, do you know what? I do sometimes generate uncomfortable emotions, but that's all that it is. It's just an uncomfortable emotion and I can cope with it. Yeah. And the more you can ask them, the important thing as well, I think is, for you to ask them to identify times themselves themselves sorry because if they've taken that train of thought themselves rather than you handing it to them and saying do you remember when if they've been able to take themselves back it's probably an experience that they've processed a little bit more and they're a bit more proud of themselves that they can then remember a little bit more because they need to be processing these things that they are coping with themselves in order to build and then, and then they can have constant reminders of that can't they you can have a little yeah. post-it note uh, yeah. you know m- remember that time when you really didn't want to 
go and play that hockey match and you're really yeah. anxious about it, but you made yourself do it. And as soon as you made yourself do it, you felt better and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, the other thing in relation to that then is the, this, this thing that I call the agony of choice. So we know that pregnant women stop smoking much more easily than anyone else does. Yeah. Okay. And the reason why that is, is because there is no agony of choice. So where most people want to stop smoking, it's because they want to stop or they've been told to stop. And actually, they don't have to stop. They want to stop. So, you know, they might say, well, I'm going to try really hard to stop smoking. Um, I, I really should stop. You know, I'm 55 now, blah, 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 blah. Most women, there's 86% of women, when they stop smoking when they're pregnant, they stop because they say, I have to stop. Yeah. yeah there's no, there's no wiggle room. Right? I'm pregnant. I don't smoke anymore. Yeah. There's no wiggle room. And because there's no wiggle room, it's like there's a law. Imagine yes. there's a universal law that if you're pregnant, you stop smoking. Okay. Yes. So you don't argue with it. Yeah. You don't go, oh, please. You're not going to mm-hmm. say to your husband, please let me carry on smoking for three months. Please let me have a few more. No. He's going to go, it's the law. Yeah. You can't do it. And yeah. when it's a hard and fast rule, you don't bother challenging it. Right. Okay. And you feel more powerful because there are rules and there are laws. And if you stay in those rules and laws, you feel safe and you still feel powerful. Yes. So if you say to your child, I'm sure it's the same in the States, but certainly in the UK, and you know better than I do, mm-hmm. you say to your child, it's the law, darling. 100%. You have to go to school. Yes. Full stop. There's no option. Yeah. There's no point pleading to me. Yes. I, I, I can't change the law. The law yep. says you've got to go to school. Yep. So you've got to go to school. You will be fine. If you feel really unwell, you know, go and see the nurse, have a chat mm-hmm. with the nurse. And if you feel really, really unwell, then the nurse will call me and we can do something about it. Yeah. But you know you were fine yesterday. You know you're really good at this. You know sometimes in the mornings you create a little bit of stress in the morning. The moment you get to school, you'll be feeling fine. Yes. Off you go. Yes. Okay. Yep. But by making it a rule or a law or something like that, you're you're taking away from the child the belief that you can change it for them yes you know yep. oh mommy of course you can you know of course you can do something about it. it's the law yes yeah okay. can i give a little uh side tip there for parents as, a, as an ex-teacher when you say it's the law you've got to go if you are unwell speak to your teacher and then you know if you say to them speak to your teacher and they'll send you home if you're unwell that's what your child's going to do <laughs> right because they they think right well that's my out so that's what I can control and they will do to the teacher what they do to you all day and they'll say I'm unwell my stomach's hurting I need to go home okay so give your if if that's where they're at give the teacher the heads up sort of say to the teacher so they're really nervous at the moment they're struggling with this this is what's going on for them just keep an eye on them reassure them they'll be fine obviously if they're unwell for goodness sake, send them home, right? If they're genuinely unwell. But actually, a lot of what we're seeing at the moment is anxiety. They've got this really big fear of being sick. Reassure them that they can cope. We've been talking at home about when they've done this. Can you think of examples in school where they've coped, where they've done well? Um, and when they've, you know, if they did something really good in a, a PE lesson, let's say, and they, they struggled with it and they overcame it, remind them of that and work together with the school to build those coping skills so that it's not one against the other because that's only going to benefit the child. If they've got somebody at school supporting them and you supporting them at home, that's only going to help build those coping skills and not give in to the desire for control. Perfect. So not giving too much power away, not not allowing them to feel powerful enough that they can make the decisions of whether they go to school or not or whether they do this or not or anything like that. It's unhelpful really unhelpful and you're making a massive rod for your own back as a yes. parent if you give too much power and if it's hard because you're not used to laying down the law with your child then don't make it about you yeah say it's the law it's, it's, the law. it's not you know mummy doesn't decide it's yeah. the law this this has to happen yeah um the other part of that would be let me think about that the other part of that would be when, when the child is exercising um, safety-seeking behaviours, and as you know, safety-seeking behaviours can be hand-washing, it can yeah. be avoidance, it could be not eating certain types of food, it can be not going to certain places, not seeing certain people, blah, blah, blah. 
I know that certain interventions, uh, a lot of CBT therapists try and immediately get the child to reduce or stop mm -hmm. their safety seeking behaviours, but actually it's unnecessary to do that uh, early on at the very, very yeah. least, yeah. because those safety seeking behaviours, let's say it's just, for example, they're washing their hands 10 times a day, okay? That safety seeking behaviour is something that they are doing to help manage their emotions, Okay, and until you start working on the very cause of the problem, they need those safety seeking behaviors to help them feel safe. Yes. Yeah, and help yep. them calm themselves down. Okay, so trying to take those away or reduce those too early, if at all, is unhelpful. Yes. But let them carry on doing their safety seeking behaviors, but while they're doing it, be building coping skills again. OK, yes. so, yes, darling, of course, you can go and wash your hands again. But remind yourself that you would cope if you were sick. It's yes. a sensible thing just to wash your hands, to be clean, especially before eating. But you're not doing it to avoid being sick. Yes. You're doing it just a sensible thing to do. And even if you were ill, you'd cope just like 99% of the rest of the world would cope. It's not that right. bad. Yep. So allowing them to do it, but reducing the fact that they're not continuing to build up their belief their phobia yes. whilst doing it you know and in the yeah. same way you know you and I probably lock our doors every night do you lock your doors at night I tend to I try okay. to remember but, <laughs> but you don't lock your doors at night because you're terrified of being burgled no right nope. you lock your doors at night because it's a sensible thing to do Sensible, you don't yeah. you don't lock your doors looking out the windows pulling the blinds down and, no. and quickly lock them because you're frightened you lock them is a sensible thing to do. So yeah. let the child wash the hands. It's a sensible mm -hmm. thing to do. But say to the child, if you're going to wash your hands, don't be anxious as well. Yes. There's no point in doing it then. If you're mm -hmm. washing your hands, which is a sensible thing to do, carry on. Yeah. So, so yeah. not allowing them to build up that fear, not allowing them to build up that phobia. That yeah. message wants to come across in everything, every interaction you have with your child about emetophobia, you want to be reiterating all the time, this is not happening to you. Yep. It's not something outside of you. It's something you've created. You've built this thing up. At one point, it didn't exist. You weren't born with it. Mm -hmm. You've built up this phobia with millions of worries and thoughts and beliefs over a period of time. It might have happened in two minutes. It might have happened in 10 years. Mm -hmm. But you've built it up. And how we get you over it is to unbuild it. Yes, to take it apart little bit by little bit to build up the resources that you didn't have when you first created it. You're going to yeah. build your self-esteem. You're going to build your social anxiety. You're going to overcome your high disgust propensity. You're going to learn some coping skills. Yeah. We're going to teach you how to manage your emotions so that you don't have to run away from situations yes. yep. where you create strong feelings. Which does bring us nicely onto coping skills. Tell me about coping skills then in in school children. Coping skills in school children. So, I mean, it links very, very much back to what we've just been talking about, doesn't it? Children are encouraged or encouraged to take risks, but within certain safe parameters. So, Ofsted actually at the minute I've put it in their in their. Um, I can't remember, I can't think of the word framework, the Ofsted framework at the moment, there is a thing that says risk taking. So they're encouraging children to take risks within safe parameters. And that's really important because Ofsted identified that previously we've been possibly as a society wrapping them in cotton wool a little bit. Okay, you can't do that because you're going you're gonna to hurt yourself and you can't do that and we'll put that safety, you know, health and safety kind of gone mad kind of thing, right? But children need to take risks they need to feel that little bit uncomfortable sometimes and we're not talking about getting in dangerous situations right but they need to be exposed to uncomfortable situations uncomfortable feelings that they're creating in order to manage them in order to handle them when they get older if you don't allow a child to experience anything uncomfortable or to take risks then how are they going to build the skills later in life to do those things because they need those skills as adults right because yeah, when they, you how are they going to grow how are they going to how are they going to gain the skills because as an adult you need to 
put the boundaries in place for yourself with risk taking. You know, you need to be able to handle those things that are uncomfortable because as an adult, you have to face them regardless. But if you don't allow your child to experience them when they are younger and you wrap them in cotton wool and you take everything away from them, that's anything that's hard and you protect them from everything, they can't build coping skills because they're they're not allowed to. They've never been... Perfect description. The same thing goes for self-efficacy, okay? Self-efficacy yeah. being self-belief, the belief you have in, in your ability to cope with life, okay? Yeah. That, people aren't born with that. Yeah. It doesn't happen to them. It's a, it's a series of skills and beliefs that you create by pushing the boundary a little bit. Yeah. If you do the yeah. same thing every day, you're not creating self-efficacy. You've got yeah. to push it a little bit further. You've got to push yourself, push your skill set. You know, mm-hmm. any as an adult, any area of your life that that that, you, that you'd feel vulnerable in, or scared of, or anxious in, push yourself to try it. Yeah. Don't dive straight in at the deep end. No, that's un, that's unhelpful and, and could frighten you. Okay? Yeah, but push those boundaries a little bit all the time. Yes, you know, and and, and if you, if you over control because you're trying to protect your child, if you over control and don't let them climb a tree and don't let them. Mm-hmm jump off the diving board or don't let them swim in the deep end, how are they ever going to learn? Yeah. And what you don't want, you don't want them to get to 12 or 13 and and you've over um, comforted them or over protected them or over controlled their environment to, in your mind, keep them safe. Yes. And they haven't got a skill set. They they don't know what to do. And it's scary, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's, it's about, you know, it's everything from, allowing them to make friends, giving them time after school to see friends and make friends and yeah. then suffer how horrible it is when a, a friend dumps you yeah. and goes and makes a new friend and the tragedy yes. of that and getting over that. Yes, yes. Getting over that. You know, it's like when you're older and you have perhaps your first girlfriend or boyfriend and, and inevitably at some point you get dumped. And, and as a parent, that's like the hardest thing to ever see is is mm. your... 18 year old child your 16 year old child your 20 who's just had their heart broken for the first time that's yeah. that's a horrible horrible feeling but that's how they go stronger yeah 100%. You, get, you, you put yourself in these situations that challenge your emotions and you tolerate them and you get stronger yes a phobia yeah. is the exact opposite to that mm-hmm. isn't it a phobia mm-hmm. is that situation scares me i'm never going anywhere near it Right. Yes. And that's why that you can maintain that your entire life. Yes. Yeah. You just avoid, you know, avoid, uh, avoid. Yeah. Avoid, avoid, avoid. So every time you avoid, especially with a child, every time you avoid, you are not getting stronger. You feel stronger because yeah. you feel better. Oh, thank yes. God. I don't have to go to school today. Oh, good. Yeah. I can sit home and relax and watch telly, right? You feel better, but actually you've just weakened yourself. Yes. Yeah. Very temporary. Yeah. Very, very temporary. It's a temporary relief, but mm-hmm. you've weakened yourself. Yes. So always pushing forward within safe boundaries, challenging yourself, particularly around anything emotional. Yes. Anything yeah. emotional at all. Just keep gently pushing it and building that belief Yes. that I can do, I can do, I can do, I can, do I can manage, I will cope. Yeah, it would yes. be nice, but you'd cope. It would it be unpleasant if you fell over on the ice okay mm-hmm. but you cope yeah it'll be all right yeah yeah yep, and getting used to um accepting that it's all right to tolerate unpleasant emotions in essence then a phobia any phobia is the person running away or avoiding feeling certain emotions yes okay yeah so if they've got a phobia they will be doing that in other areas of their life as well mm-hmm they're saying, I don't like these strong emotions I create in this situation. Yeah. I'm going to avoid it. Yep. Okay? So it won't ever be an isolated thing. There will be other areas in their life that they're doing that, but you just might not see it. Yes. Okay, but it's yes. a fear of your own emotion. Yep. That's why it's so important not to sustain that. Yes. And to, and to yep. challenge it and to build coping skills and to feel more able and more capable. And two other coping skills, I mean, it's not going to sound like a coping skill, but two other coping skills, particularly in this scenario, would be self-esteem and social confidence. Yes. 
Yeah. It's weird to think of them as coping skills, but of course, individually, they're massively important things, possibly the two most important things, self-esteem and, and, and social confidence. But in relation to a phobia, that they, they, they come under they come under the term coping skills because having good self-esteem gives you the confidence to push yourself to cope. Yes. Having good uh, uh, social confidence. I mean, most most metaphobes wouldn't have a metaphobia mm -hmm. if they didn't already have some social anxiety. Yes. A big yes. a big part, a big contributing factor to a metaphobia is social anxiety. You know, the fear yeah. of being judged, the fear yes. of being scrutinised, the fear yeah. of people perceiving you as not good enough or bad or dirty, or whatever. Which is one of the reasons why ninety x percent of sufferers are female. Yeah, and many, I think many, it's many, important many, many more there, girls and boys. I think it's important there to explain social anxiety isn't just avoiding social situations because i've had parents before that say well they're not socially anxious they've got loads of friends they go to loads of parties and um, they're always talking they're always making new friends they've always they've been great with other people that in isn't social anxiety in itself they can be confident when they go and speak to people and they can believe in their skill set to be around other people but internally if they're going oh, well i've got to say this and i've got to look this way and my hair's got to be this way and i've got to be presenting if they are creating lots of anxiety whilst doing those things that is still social anxiety it's it might not show in their behavior particularly but they will still be having those thoughts and those anxious creating those anxious feelings around what other people think of them or how they are coming across in social situations they'll be putting loads of effort into how they're coming across and what other people think of them and making sure that they come across in a certain way so even if their behavior doesn't show it they are very very likely to be having lots of uncomfortable socially anxious thoughts in those times yeah. and, and essentially as a child that is worrying excessively what other people think of me yes yeah and we know that girls work harder in education and get better results in education primarily because there's a lot more pressure on them and there's a lot more social pressure there's a lot more social anxiety to perform and look and feel and be a certain way and so right. they work harder at it yeah 100%. so but also social anxiety in this context could be seen as a projection of, of self-esteem couldn't it yes 100 percent. okay and Always, what we yeah. mean by that is if there's something you worry about in yourself you're way more likely to worry that other people think the same thing yeah. so for example an obvious one right if i don't like the fact that i'm bald right if mm -hmm. i think somehow it looks silly or i'm or i'm not a man or or, or i just don't like the fact i'm being bald <laughs> I'm way more likely to worry that other people think the same thing. Yes. Okay. Yep. But yep. if I'm really happy with it, I couldn't care less what other people think. Right. So yep. if you're really happy with you, yep. you don't really have any social anxiety. If you're right. genuinely happy with you, who you are, what you're like, how good you are as a friend, how nice you are as a person, you know, how you look, how you feel, if you're yes. happy with you, if your self-esteem is good. Yes. It's very unlikely that you've got lots of social anxiety. Correct. Excuse yep. me. Yeah. So working on that self-esteem. Yes. And, you know, we talked, we mentioned the inner voice earlier on. So, and parents might not know this, but self-esteem, people often think again that self-esteem, like a phobia, is something that happens to you. Yes. It's an isolated, yeah. there's a child over there, look, and life is making that child's self-esteem 50 percent right we know of course that self-esteem is just what you think of you right yes. it's an internal dialogue yep. okay and if their internal dialogue if their inner voice is good and helpful and charitable and kind and supportive then their self-esteem is going to be high yes if their inner voice is self-critical and questioning and putting themselves down then their self-esteem is going to be low yep and their social anxiety high yes so a really it, important thing is to help and support your child to have a really empowering inner voice. The way they talk to themselves yeah. should be charitable, empowering, forgiving, mm -hmm.
kind. Yes. Not not perfectionist. Not I have to do this brilliantly. I have to score one hundred percent. I have to yeah. get all these exams, A stars, or else that that's you know doomed to failure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because that just creates a whole load of anxiety. It does. Okay. You know, I, I, they just want to be good enough. They want to be good enough. They want to be nice enough. They want to be kind enough. Yeah. So talking to yourself in a helpful, supportive, empowering way is the key to creating good self-esteem. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And something you mentioned earlier, making a note of all the times you're successful at something, making yeah. a note of all the nice things that happen. We call it a positives list in the, in the, in the Thrive Manual, right? In the Emetophobia Manual, writing the positives, having a list of all the things you've been good at in the last few weeks all the nice things that have happened all the all yeah. the nice experiences you've had yes they help to keep you thinking nice they empowering do empowering thoughts about yourself and i think a key thing with that is if for example a child gets given a bracelet by a friend a friend's made them a bracelet you know a friendship bracelet thing which is quite common uh, in primary schools so that happens a key question to ask your child is, well, what does that say about you? Not about your friend, because what they'll say is, oh, my friend's lovely. My friend's a really nice person. I've got really nice friends. No, not what it says about your friends. What does it say about you? It says that somebody's taken the time to think about me. I'm likable. I'm a good person. People care about me, right? So it's all about them. How does it, how, what does it say about them? And equally, when they have gone up that high ropes and gone across something, okay, that's brilliant, well done. What does it say about you? Ask them the question because then they've got to reflect and verbalize the fact that they are brave and that they can do difficult things and that they are a nice person. And it's interesting when you ask your child actually what they think about themselves, it's actually quite heartbreaking to listen to some children who are really quite young say that they're no good and that they're a bit of a loser and no one likes them. It's, it's, it's heartbreaking as a parent to hear that. So anything you can do to build your child's inner voice to be some, someone as in you've got a best friend next to you talking to you all the time, you can do that, you'll be fine. You're brilliant, lots of people like you. If you've got that going on, little person on your shoulder, little voice going, they're gonna feel better going through their day. They're gonna feel more confident. They're going to feel like they can tackle things. If they've got someone, oh, you're a bit of a loser, nobody likes you, then they're, they're gonna be less confident. So anything they can do to build their self-esteem. Well, I just wanted to tie it all together because I know this is titled Top 5 Tips, right? I think we've covered four potentially, but let's just go for the four and then very quickly because I know we're running out of time here. Five, <laughs> just so let's tie it together. So what was the first one? The first one was don't see it as an isolated incident. Yeah, well, the first isolated thing was incident. upskill yourself as a parent. There we go. Sorry, upskill yourself. Yes. Ups upskill yourself. Uh, learn everything you can about emetophobia and do it all on our website. Um, so that empowers you to help yes. your child and understand these next five things. Perfect. So, so that was number one. So number two then was don't, don't see, it, see it as an isolated thing. Okay. It's right. not an isolated symptom. It's part of, it's created by your child's beliefs, thinking, styles, behaviors, uh, um, the way they talk to themselves, self-esteem. So all of those things, discuss propensity, all those things together. So you've got to treat all of those things and yep. generally raise all of those things for your child yep. and the symptom will disappear, the phobia will disappear. You can't Perfect. just try and treat the isolated thing. Lovely. Number three then was don't give in to their desire for control. Don't collude with them. Don't don't collude with them. Be supportive. Be obviously be supportive. Yeah. Be loving. Be yeah. kind. Be helpful. Okay, yeah. but don't collude with their belief yes. that they're powerless and it's yeah. happening to them. Okay, yes. continually reinforce that it, that they're, they're creating it themselves. They've created this phobia themselves, and with time and the application, a bit of effort over a few weeks or a few months, they can undo what they've done. They can uncreate it by unraveling it by yep. thinking better and by helping themselves feel much stronger. Lovely. Number four then was coping skills. Coping skills Those generally. Coping skills. Okay. Yep. You know, we, we do two things. We either, we either, if we don't believe we can cope with something, we try and avoid it yep. or control it. Okay. So you've got control skills, you've got coping skills. If, if a child has a phobia, they're way more likely to start developing more and more control skills, trying to control yeah. the environment rather than believe they can manage their emotions. Right. So you want to be teaching and encouraging to push yourself and realize you can cope. 
You yes. can manage your emotions. It's not the end of the world. You're not going to you're not going to die. Yeah. And just on that note, I know you want to do this quickly. When someone says to you, when a child says, "I can't cope," I won't be able to cope. It's a very catastrophic statement, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it implies that something massive and terrible and catastrophic yes. is going to ha- happen. So it's sometimes worth asking them, "What do you mean by that?" Yeah. When you say you can't cope, what do you think is going to happen? Mm-hmm. Oh, I just won't be able to cope. Oh, I just couldn't cope. You say that, yeah. but what what do you think would happen? Because actually, mm-hmm. all that would happen was you'd feel a bit uncomfortable for five minutes, yeah. feel a bit unpleasant. It would stop. You'd wash your mouth out and clean your teeth, and life would just go on. Mm-hmm. When you say you couldn't cope, yes, what are you imagining happening? Yeah, and that's yeah. kind of reframing their thinking and getting them out of using that kind of catastrophic language. Yeah. That's coping skills. Yes. Perfect. Okay. And then the last one then is self-esteem. Number five is build their self-esteem. Get that inner voice to be charitable, supportive, kind, nurturing towards themselves. Yeah. So self-esteem and social anxiety are linked. It's like a set yep. of scales. Okay. Yep. If your self-esteem is high, your social anxiety is low. If your self-esteem yep. is low, your social anxiety is high. Because generally speaking, in this context at least, social anxiety is a projection of how you feel about you. If yes. you're happy with you you really won't care very much about what anyone else thinks about it. Okay. Yes. If I've done a drawing and I'm happy with it, if everyone else hates it, it doesn't matter because I'm happy with it. Yes. But if I'm insecure about it and I'm not sure, and someone says, oh, God, Rob, what's that? Okay. It, it, it can feel like it's 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 really painful that, that what that person said really made me feel X, yes. which yes. we know is not true. It's about the way you think about you that yes. matters that that. Inner voice is a great podcast we did a couple of weeks back on inner voice and how you talk to yourself in a nurturing, supportive, empowering way. Yes. Perfect. So those are our, our top five tips for parents, for anyone who has a child with emetophobia. Um, I hope it was helpful. Lovely. And we're doing another one next week. Do we know yet yes. what we're talking about next week? I don't think we do. We've had a uh, request online um what somebody has requested that we talk about when someone who like myself has got over being sick the fear of being sick and then they are sick or they feel sick right. what it's like so that could be one for the future i don't know if that's next week but that's certainly one for the future but there's plenty to go up perfect lovely i'm getting out in the sunshine you have a lovely oh, day and i'll see you next good. week all right take care thanks rob bye bye